this is a laser that sends out a pulse at 100 megahertz, and the pulse is split, and it goes into both, simultaneously into both of these spools. And the, all of the, uh, the optical um, lengths and the spool lengths have been very carefully calibrated so that the time it takes to transition or to do a transit of a pulse through one of the spools is the same as in the other spool. But of course, in the real physical world, nothing can ever be exactly the same. So we run this for a while, and we see what the, what the difference is in timing in, for the, the pulses to get through these two spools. And we can measure it down to about 100 femtoseconds. Uh, so we get a very precise measurement of how long it takes for light to get through these things. So the task will be to present only one of these spools to a meditator, probably on some, some fancy looking little table. Here's the spool, make light slow down. Imagine a field around it, imagine whatever you need to do in order to have light slow down. What they don't know, except maybe psychically, is that we have this other spool. And that other spool we don't tell them about to act as a, a, a control comparison. So we're looking at differences in the speed of, the, of light and how fast it transitions through these, these two spools. The, the advantage of this is that we have extremely high resolution in terms of the actual speed of light. It takes only 20 microseconds to get through this spool, but since we have femtosecond resolution, we can tell to a, a, about a more, something like one in a million factor of, of whether the speeds are gonna be different. The disadvantage of using optical fiber is that the glass, uh, the index of re refractivity is sensitive to temperature. So we have all kinds of temperature sensors inside, outside, in this apparatus, in the room, all over the place, to be able to tell if we, if we get a result, was it due to temperature? Uh, it turns out in the calibration tests that we can detect a temperature difference of something like um, a milli degree, about a thousandth of a degree Fahrenheit which you can get pretty, pretty easily if somebody walks into the room and happens to be closer to this one versus that one. We can pick it up pretty quickly. And it's, it's due completely to the fact, even though this is actually inside a, 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 the equivalent of a, a, a thermos with lots of padding and, and air bubbles and all kinds of stuff, you still see a difference. So it's very, very sensitive. So the, this apparatus will not be in the vicinity of people doing the experiment. We, we can't do that. This will be in the sealed room. The people doing the experiment will be at a distance. And I'll end there, and thank you for your kind attention. Questions, comments? Uh, very good experiments. A um, couple comments and one question. First of all, you said you didn't know if you do the double split experiment instead of the interferometer. Perhaps you do one half the slit red and the other one blue and tell them to concentrate red or blue and that would take it to one side or the other. That's a good idea. And, um, also, in, in the interferometer experiment, you said that the pulsing is sort of like the heart rate. Have you measured it against heart rate? Because that may give you an indication of physiolo physiology. That's I, I haven't on. looked at heart rate on this. This is a, a, a created movie. I mean, you know, we're taking pictures one frame per second. So this is actually not, it's not real time. It's just, oh, okay. just a movie. Okay, but still there might be a correlation. You might check might that, be. it might be the physiology. Be. And finally, if the speed of light is changing, and if you could do that in vacuo, so the heat isn't affecting it, what you could probably be doing is you could be changing the permittivity of the permeability of space and or your, your uh, light medium. Right. Yeah, and my, I, I was very glad to see uh, in this conference so far a number of people talking about theoretical issues because my mind really doesn't go there. I, I, can't, I, I can't do that so for some reason. But so I'm purely an empiricist, and I figure that if I get a result like this, my job then is to present it to a bunch of theorists to excite them and figure out, well, now how do you explain that? <laughs> so what I'm good at is figuring out how to do this and to get the right set and setting to encourage people to actually get a result. In the presentment experiments, Dean, is the ordering of the photos, have they been analyzed to see whether they're strictly random? You mentioned they're randomly selected by computer. I'm just wondering, since operators can interact with REGs, whether subjects, um, it may be a more complex mechanism, not just presentment, but some kind of interaction of subjects with that REG, as well as uh, a precognition. Yeah, that's a good question. And we, we have checked, at least in the studies that I've done involving pictures, We've checked to see whether 
uh, pleasant pictures come up more often than not pleasant pictures, and basically it is random. They're, they're coming up with the, the frequency you would expect, which is a little surprising, actually, because some of the pictures you really don't want to see. They're, I mean, they're very nasty pictures, and once you see them, they're in your head, and you want to get them out, but they still come up at the, the same frequency. Now, I don't think that's actually true for, it's true across all subjects, pooled, but I don't think it's true on some individuals. Because I, I have a few individuals who, once they figure out that there are erotic targets, they really get a lot of erotic targets. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you see a presentiment effect in that study, and sometimes you don't. But you know, go back and look at it, they're getting like, they're just basically getting a, a, a porn download, <laughs> is what they're getting. So I think some people actually are able to, to influence a generator to get what they want. But, but in general, across all subjects, they're, they're not doing that. Dean, you've, you've generally produced mind-blowing results, but these ones, to me, are just doubly mind-blowing. Uh, the fact that you've been able to distinguish between a likely future and the actual future is, is very exciting, and I'd really like to replicate that one. Uh, then your other experiment regarding the um, interferometer versus the, uh, the double slit. Mm -hmm. As you know, I disagree with the interferometer uh, interpretation. And I think if you can show the double slit thing works, as far as I know, that'll be the first really solid proof that we do have some sort of an observer effect and that there really is a quantum mechanical aspect to what we do. And I, I haven't seen anything else that really shows that. Well, my inspiration actually were two experiments done in, at the Paralab. In the pair lab, a double slit apparatus actually worked, but the, uh, the, the sister experiment was done by a skeptic from York University, and his version of it did not work. So the, the, the score so far is two to one, basically. Yeah, great experiments. Something curious about your curves that you show on this uh, skin response. At onset, they all start at the same point, but you show data before onset of the right. trial, no, but this, this and is, they diverge. This is an, an analytical. So what's the magic there? The, the magic is that analytically, you clamp the skin conductance or the, the pupil dilation, whatever the measure is, you clamp it at the moment of the button press, because what we're actually interested in is the change in physiology from the moment that you begin the trial. But isn't that strange that the flow, free flow before the onset, sort of of the same pattern? You still see the red curve above the blue one. Yes, that's strange. I just, I just want to make one quick comment uh, after complimenting Dean uh, similarly uh, for the elegance and the, the uh, multi-degrees that you uh, capture. Um, Clearly, your work, in my mind, points us toward the significance of Charlie Tart's proposal 40 years ago that we need state-specific sciences. Because the difference in meditators and non-meditators? Yes. yes. I think we have in order Russell, then York, and then we'll see how much time we have. I'm very happy to see your success with showing that what a person sees is the actual future, because that had been a contentious issue for many years. Uh, a dozen years ago, I did that experiment with my daughter Elizabeth, where we had one, we had six targets. One had a 50% probability, and the other had a tenth uh, probability of coming up. And we again showed that people do indeed see the actual target and not the uh, highly probable target. That the presence of a big target, percentage-wise, did not interfere with the ESP. And for people who are using psychic ability to forecast changes in the stock market, it's very important that you see what's actually going to happen rather than what people think is going to happen. Right. And it's actually thinking about what, what Courtney presented with LA, that, you know, that, that makes me kind of nervous as well, if, if that's an actual future as opposed to a probable future. Um, you commented that you hoped to get uh, some theoretical interest out of this, and I'd like to mention that your uh, uh, interferometer experiment has opened, I think, the biggest theoretical can of worms we've ever seen in a psi experiment, because every study of the, the double slit or double path interference effect has established that what breaks the interference is 
the possibility of getting which way 